And so the session will be on. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed Razani. I'm a professor and chair of the Electrical Engineering Department at New York City College of Technology in New York, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, just briefly to let you know that our department has about 800 students. We have three degree programs, uh, two associate, one bachelor in telecommunication, and we're offering another bachelor in electrical engineering technology in the coming fall. So we have two uh, programs, with their two plus two programs. Uh, I teach uh, every year one semester a standard communication course in our department since I'm a chair. But before I used to teach uh, uh, other courses as well. So the topic of the talk today is cell communication and its application in classroom environment. I'll be spending more than half of the time uh, talking about what cell communication is, what are the characteristics of satellites, what are the obvious frequency, and so on. And then we'll get to the applications uh, from the halfway. So the content is. Uh, the characteristics of cellular communication, the orbit, frequency bands, and networks, and then the, this application in different specification and telemedicine. Cellular communication, what makes cellular communication so unique and special? It's uh, universal uh, coverage. As uh, you might know, we can cover the whole Earth by uh, if you are in a geostationary orbit that I will be talking about, with only three satellites. So by only having three satellites, you can cover the entire Earth, except the North and South Pole that uh, is covered by lower orbit satellites. It's unique application remote and uh, densely, uh, low density areas and emergency situations. Uh, as you know, there are several different transmission systems that are used to uh, relay signals from one point to another. There are fiber optics, the coaxial cable, microwave, and even troposcattered uh, communication. One is satellite. The, what makes satellite uh, different than all the others is that it's used for uh, low density areas and remote areas uh, where you can either uh, it's very hard to reach those areas or is uh, economically not feasible to reach a very remote area with a number of uh, maybe 1,500 population that spend billions or millions of dollars to, to get this thing up to that point. Yeah, yeah or, or you can just bring this down to the later. Thank you. And this is for the population. Okay. Thank you. So uh, actually, what I ask all my students at the beginning of the course when I start teaching it, I, I ask them, uh, which one of these transmission systems is the best uh, solution for if you are asked to design a communication infrastructure for a given area, which one of these transmission systems would you choose? And I will go through the transmission uh, transmission line, the coaxial cable, fiber optic, and so on. A lot of them will say fiber optic is the best, and some of them will say satellite communication because they are in the satellite communication course. But the answer is actually depends on the application and where you want to use it. And most of the time, you use all of these different transmission systems all in, uh, together in, the, in a given area. You might use wire lines and coaxial cable and fiber optic and satellite all in a given uh, area. The one, another really unique practice of satellite communication is quick installation and commissioning. So if, uh, if there is, a, for example, a tornado or hurricane somewhere and you lost the communication uh, link, the best way is to just move in a truck with the antenna and uh, get the connection and cover the, uh, cover the area, uh, providing the voice, video, and audio immediately. It takes uh, less than an hour to, to do that. And some of you might have direct TV or other uh, satellite-based uh, television programming. You'll notice that when they come to put the set up your system, it takes uh, maybe less than an hour to set up the antenna and point it to the satellite and it's not the, the link. So that, that's one of the unique characters of satellite communication because other, uh, other systems like fiber optic or microwave or coaxial cable or other uh, systems, they, they need much longer planning and installation and commissioning and all that. And uh, we talked about the unique application of satellite communication in distance education and telemedicine. Uh, we'll see how it has been effective in bringing 
uh, the remote areas uh, into the system. Uh, there are thousands of schools are covered with one program in uh, so many countries. And uh, of course, we have not been able to take advantage of this unique uh, characteristic of satellite uh, in the U.S. as much as some of the other countries have. But I think it's uh, a very feasible solution to a lot of uh, for a lot of uh, developing countries, especially those who have limited uh, uh, limited space in terms of universities, colleges, and uh, professors who can teach, so they can share all these common. Uh, uh, High level uh, systems that they have in the country, so the country to the remote area and start having them to uh, be sent to those the remote areas to teach. What makes satellite system? Uh, the three basic uh, elements in sat any satellite communication system one is uh, the space segment, the satellite itself, one is the air segment, and the other one is the link budget. By link budget, what I mean is all the parameters that are involved in the Optic and downlink of the signal to the satellite, all the uh, systems or parameters that are uh, effective uh, on <coughs> attenuating the signal or uh, amplifying the signal or changing the frequency, and all those are in the link budget, uh, which is very essential to any satellite communication system. And major satellite parameters, uh, there are two major parameters that everyone who wants to say that they have any uh, little knowledge of satellite communication they should be aware of and then one is orbits and the other one is frequency band. We'll, I'll talk about those you know, as we want. Classes <coughs> of uh, communication satellite, as we said, uh, communicating the school hospitals, banks, retailers, and other enterprises will watch through satellite because of uh, these categories available everywhere. So you can have once you have a satellite coverage in a given region, whether it is a country or a state or even a remote area, then in that area you will have satellite coverage. It's just a matter of setting up an antenna and receiving the signal. So it is available everywhere, regardless of the distance that each point are of the other. Broadcast distribution, you can broadcast your signal uh, to whatever point is uh, within the footprint of the satellite. So if the footprint how is a given a state or a given country, then you can broadcast any program uh, in that whole area. The economic system, if you compare the system when you do a cost analysis between standard and other transmission system, you notice that in uh, most of the cases, uh, standard is uh, economically better than the other. Of course, it depends, as I said, uh, most, most of the cases. If you are to set up your own, uh, private standard communication system which involves the satellite uh, in the space, uh, all the earth segment, uh, the control system, what is called CT and C which controls the, the space segment, and the link budgeting and all that, the, the cost might be uh, very high. But most of the time for uh, using the standard communication in a given area, you don't have to set up uh, the whole system by yourself. You can be part of the, what is called transponder of the space segment and use that as uh, your uh, uh, communication means and then set up the remote area. So the cost would be uh, much smaller than, uh, for example, setting up a phone uh, fiber optic system for a human being. It's a very reliable uh, system. Uh, actually, to make it uh, almost 100% uh, reliability and availability to the, to the users, they have uh, a different system which actually uh, Cost a little bit more, but uh, it assures, especially the financial institutions, that they're not losing any time uh, when they're, they are uh, using satellite communication. And that is by uh, making sure that the satellite provider uh, provides, if the system goes out, they, they are able to immediately provide another uh, uh, space, follow the space segment to the user so they won't lose any, any time uh, in the communication. As I mentioned, it's uh, fast uh, deployment and installation is uh, another unique characteristic uh, the network capacity expansion. So uh, this is also uh, uh, an important part of the satellite communication because in other systems, if you have a switching uh, which is made for 5,000 users and if you have 5,001 users, then you have to have uh, set up another uh, new switch uh, for 5,000 so that the 5,001 users will be able to use the system. But in, in case of the satellite, you can expand the, the system 
without any additional cost because the footprint is covering the whole area and all you have to do is to set up the antenna and receive it in the system and that will provide you with the communication. These are the different types of the orbits that uh, are using satellite communication. Basically, there are three different types of orbits. One is called low F orbit, LEO. One is called the uh, uh, geo, geo, geo stationary F orbit. And the other one is medium F orbit. And uh, of course, there are uh, some of the satellites that are shown in, in these orbits that uh, some are circular, some are elliptical. And, uh, but they all uh, cover uh, the area uh, given that uh, if you're, you're using a low Earth orbit, the coverage time is smaller. If you're using a medium Earth orbit, which is a higher altitude, you will have uh, a higher coverage in terms of the time. But it still not 24 hours. The only system that gives you 24 hours coverage uh, of the region is geostationary Earth orbit. And I'll be talking about that as we go on. This shows also the, these uh, three uh, uh, orbits. Uh, as you can see, the number of uh, satellites increase uh, if you go from geostation to low orbit. So you need only one geostationary orbit to cover that uh, whole region, and then you need four medium Earth orbit satellites to cover that region, and then you need six in the low Earth orbit. So as you come lower, your coverage area is smaller, so you will need more number of satellites to cover the human region. The lowest orbit, uh, or LEO, is between 100 to 300 miles above the our planet. And uh, satellite must travel at 17,500 miles an hour, and it will go around Earth in 1.5 uh, hours. That's 90 minutes uh, the satellite will uh, go around the Earth. The receivers on the ground must track the satellites because the satellites are moving. The antennas on the receiving station they must, they must uh, track the satellite as they come into the view of the antenna until it goes out of the view. So uh, there's different type of tracking system on, on the antenna that is used uh, to keep track of the satellite. Examples of these uh, noise orbits is Iridium Global Star and International Space Station. So I don't know how much you're familiar, but this, uh, these two, the Iridium and Global Star, are providing uh, wireless communication throughout the world. So if someone uh, in the U.S. has a Iridium system and another person in whatever part of the world uh, is living has the uh, same receiver, they can communicate with one another through satellite. And uh, the cost is, uh, it, when it started, uh, it was like eight, eight and a half dollar a minute. So that is like in 2000, 2001. But now it's less than a dollar. It's like 60, 70 cents a minute. So it, it makes sense now to have it uh, was not at that time. But actually, the company, the Iridium, went bankrupt because of that, because they invested $5.3 billion into the system. And then when it became operational, they didn't have that many users because of the high cost. So they decided to, so actually at one point, uh, they decided to destroy all the talent. Uh, and it was the New York Times that they were going to build all these 66 satellites that they had in the system uh, towards Earth at a different angle and the speed so that it will burn as they uh, enter to the atmosphere. But another company uh, came and bought it for, I think, 70, 80 million dollars. $5.3 billion dollar company was sold for 70, 80 million dollars. And they started uh, using providing service and its operational right now. And uh, we are all familiar with the National Space Station. Which, uh, uh, there's a lot of research that uh, goes on in, in that station, and uh, it's kind of hard to imagine that uh, such a station which humans are staying in there and doing research and living in there uh, is uh, uh, traveling at 70,500 miles an hour around there. So it is very think of it. Is. Okay, the user's data is uh, the lowest orbit. Uh, actually, the International Telecommunication Union has uh, divided or allocated different frequency bands to different types of uh, services. And the, the names that are called Little Leo or Big Leo are the names that are given by International Telecommunication Union, uh, which is just called the universe. So, for Little Leo, the frequency allocation is less than 1 gigahertz. It's mostly in US, UHF, uh, VHF bands. 
one uh, uh, system that started to launch satellites, but unfortunately they were not so successful in FAI SAT. The other uh, LEO is Big LEO, which provides voice and data. So if uh, a company decides to provide voice and uh, data to low Earth orbit satellites, they have to use the frequency larger than one gigahertz, and this is what the FCC mandates. Uh, that uh, this is a big LEO, you can only use frequency higher than one gigahertz to provide the voice and uh, data. Uh, examples are Iridium and Global Star that I just uh, talked about in the previous slide. The last one is uh, broadband LEO, where you have voice, data, and video communication. And the frequency is much larger than one gigahertz. It's around uh, it's the KA or KU band frequency. And uh, one system that is not yet operational uh, is Teledesic. Uh, Teledesic is a system which has 288 satellites, and uh, the major shareholder is uh, Bill Gates. Uh, and uh, I think the uh, investment was somewhere around nine billion dollars uh, for this uh, program deal. So you can have voice, video, and uh, data uh, through that uh, 288 satellites that are. Uh, how would use that? Can you give an example of who would use that? Well, for video conferencing, maybe for, uh, as I said, distance education and telemedicine, those type of applications that you need interactive, real-time type of communication system. In uh, yeah. in, well, in remote or between countries. For example, you have uh, GM has a headquarters in the U.S. and some branches all over the world. They might want to train their workers through that type of the system. Is the economic difference. Yeah. What kind of latency are you talking about between the latency differences between the lower Earth orbit and the higher orbit? Uh, actually, I will be talking about that, but not as you brought it up. Is uh, one of the item actually this says short propagation delay. So the delay is uh, very close to like a link. If you have a fiber optic link, is very close to fiber optic. Maybe twice uh, as much delay for the lower Earth orbit. Because it's uh, like between 500 and 700 kilometers above there. So, so ping is, is like milliseconds. Right, right. right. Uh, but when you go higher in geostationary, the delay becomes uh, kind of a problem for some of these applications. Advantages low power requirements and short propagation delay. And uh, disadvantages the greater number of satellites are needed to. Uh, cover the area. As I said, uh, Iridium, for example, needs 66. Global Star needs 48 satellites. Uh, broadband Leo, the Teledesic needs uh, 288 satellites. So the doors <coughs> can come in the orbit they need to look at. Just to help me clarify, I, I think I understand. The, uh, the, the geostationary one up there right. is essentially feels like it's the same place so my satellite right, 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 right. But these lower ones, my dish is going to have to go like this right, right. and then hand off to the right, right. 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 So there are momentary delays right. that rotate around the other side. Uh, there's a the hot shaking between the antennas so the user will not uh, see oh. the delay. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, every antenna has to have a tracking system attached to it. So it yeah. has to try to understand like, the when it comes in this view and when it uh, leaves other view. But the main advantage of uh, geostationary is that uh, you don't need that. And yeah. That's and it's not like you're going to burn up in the atmosphere. Right. <laughs> so the medium Earth orbit is 6,000 to 12,000 miles above uh, the planet uh, Earth and also it, it could be elliptical uh, in motion and it will uh, uh, receivers on the ground also have to track these satellites because they're still there in medium Earth orbit. The only satellites that you don't need to track are the ones in geostation. Any other orbit, the antenna have to track the, the satellites. And uh, the examples include global uh, positioning system, GPS satellites. So the GPS is uh, one of the categories of satellites that are medium Earth orbit. They are not low Earth orbit, they are not geostationary. They are medium Earth orbit. Uses uh, cellular telephone and GPS. Advantage, the antenna size and power are relatively modest uh, and latency is still small. It's larger than the lowest orbit, but the smallest uh, compared to geostationary. And one of the disadvantages that is actually uh, is avoidable in proximity to Van Allen belts, uh, 
so which is uh, create presence for electronic system. Is I have the atmosphere that uh, you have to actually uh, operate uh, the standards have to be there above is well now and also below so that it won't uh, be within the this diamond layer of the atmosphere. So uh, just then I'll also that uh asteroid I mean like no, it's a, it's a layer of the atmosphere that uh, has uh, is ionized in the condensed uh, ionized area in that layer of the atmosphere. And if anything operates in that region, then uh, the radio radio communication yeah, will be uh, Now, the geostationary is uh, the most widely used uh, orbit uh, for stellar uh, communication. It's about 36,000. Uh, it's longer uh, above Earth, and uh, the satellite uh, covers the Earth 24 hours. So it moves at the same speed and in the same direction as the rotation of the Earth. So the antenna uh, is uh, fixed. Uh, if you have seen all these uh, uh, direct TV antennas on the, on the roof of the houses, you don't see them moving. They are all fixed. So they are, in, uh, they are getting signal from the geostation satellite. So that was the main advantage, and somebody with Nate Clark in 1945 actually came up with that idea. And he published a paper uh, in the uh, wireless journal in uh, New England. And uh, he actually witnessed the launch of a satellite in 1965, 20 years later. And he recently passed away, I think 2007 or 2008. So he is, a, he is considered as the father of uh, satellite communication because that really. Uh, had a big impact on the communication satellites. These satellites are positioned uh, above the equator and travel at the same speed direction as the Earth, and uh, we need only three satellites in this orbit to cover the entire Earth. So every 120 degrees, uh, if you look at the, the circle, uh, circular shape of the Earth, every 120 degrees, you need one satellite. So for the 360, you you have the three satellites which cover the, the entire Earth. And most of the communication satellites uh, these days are still uh, uh, to be launched into, into this orbit. And this shows uh, just a picture of how the, the different orbits uh, might be, and also uh, also the link between the satellites. Some of the, uh, some, if you were, for example, user A wants to contact user B, which is not in the same footprint of a satellite in one of these three satellites, then there has to be two hop type of communication. So user A has to send a signal to the satellite back to the uh, some middle point, and then that middle point has to send a signal up to the satellite, and then back again to the user B, which is in a different coverage area. Now to uh, reduce this uh, double hop, uh, which has a, a big impact on the delay of the signal, you link the satellite to one another. So the user A sends a signal to satellite A, satellite A sends it to satellite B, and then satellite B sends it to the user B. So that way you reduce the, you have reduced the delay uh, in half by, by doing that. So that is called inter-satellite link. And that uh, type of link is uh, usually carried out at very high frequencies, somewhere between 40 to 60 gigahertz. This gives you an idea of how the satellites are located around there. Two station satellites. Another image. Ah. This is the light image I found and the light I thought I put it up here. So is this regulated internationally in any way? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, ITU, International Telecommunication Union in Geneva, they regulate uh, all the telecommunication systems, including telecommunication. Mm -hmm. So if uh, a country A wants to launch a satellite, when they put the RFP and the proposal and everything is finalized, they send uh, the complete description of the system to ITU. Then ITU, what they do, they will uh, share that information with the neighboring countries. And uh, ITU asks them whether this system is going to interfere within your system. Of course, ITU itself does the interference analysis, uh, but just to make sure that no one has a system that might interfere. They will share it with them. They give them about six to nine months. They will respond if they have any problems. They have uh, the uh, company, the country who is providing system has to make correction. If not, then they go ahead. So every 
frequency band that is used for satellite, every satellite itself will already serve the criteria. And that, that is uh, for the domestically uh, organization of FCC for United States. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah. There appears to be uh, identity over uh, North America. Is that is this is that meant that is this is this accurate that way? Or right, right. This is the actual picture of the uh, satellite in space. Actually, NASA has a uh, tracking uh, software which are used in by class, and it's real time uh, real time tracking uh, system that you can see the satellites moving in real time around Earth. So uh, North America, of course, they have more satellites. And uh, because of the uh, applications they have and more usage they have, they have reduced, uh, and uh, I don't know if one of the slides, maybe I don't have a slide here, but the spacing between satellites are uh, two degrees that are set by ITU uh, as the standard. So if you are uh, closer than two degrees, they tend to interfere with one another. And in uh, the block that is uh, uh, defined for each standard, they have to be within that uh, box of the allocated uh, orbital location. If they move plus or minus 0 0.1 degree from that uh, uh, block, uh, box that they have given, then the TTNC from the Earth station has to uh, send an order uh, or command to the satellite to move, move it back to that uh, box that uh, they were allocated. And the satellite, they have uh, engines uh, around it that will ignite and move it uh, to whatever direction they need. So, so the lifespan of one the, I mean, eventually the fuel will run out, so right. what's the lifespan? Lifespan, 15 to 20 years. Right. And then they come back? For the and then, uh, the, uh, they also, but, uh, yeah, they will be moved uh, to uh, 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 orbit, which is about 300 uh, kilometers above the geostationary mm -hmm. orbit, and they will uh, eventually get destroyed. Uh, yeah. They are moved uh, to, with the control system. They can move satellite from one orbit to another orbit. Uh, actually, this was uh, at some point was uh, kind of a habit for some countries because ITU has allocated orbital location to each of the member country, 189 countries. And if they cannot use that orbital location, then that orbital location is taken away from them. Mm -hmm. So for them to keep that orbital location, some of the satellites which are uh, out of their life, uh, 15, 17 years old, the country who wants to keep that option location actually buys this used satellite, just like buying a used car. They buy a used satellite, the control system from the ground moves that uh, satellite, the used satellite from the orbital location that the country was using for 17, 18 years to this new location that the country wants to keep it. And it is there until they are ready to launch their own satellite. So the, one of the reasons that is then said here is also that US uh, FCC has defined one degree separation between satellites, or the satellites only that covers the U.S. Internationally, as I mentioned, two degrees uh, separation for uh, satellites, for U.S. is one degree, so there are more number of satellites for the U.S. Uh, or the North uh, and the uh, This uh, gives some idea of the different type of uh, satellite service. Uh, Basically, three different types, but uh, recently the personal satellite service has also been added to this. Is one is FSS, free satellite service. The other one is the MSS, <coughs> mobile satellite service, and the third one is BSS, broadcast satellite service. So in FSS is, uh, is to the fixed earth station, and the example is Intelsat. Intelsat, you might have heard the name, is the largest uh, satellite organization worldwide with over 50 satellites in space. And headquarters in Washington, D.C. The mobile satellite uh, service is uh, to the vehicle, ships, and aircraft. And uh, unfortunately, on the flight that I had from New York, they said they would provide a Wi-Fi, and that's supposed to be through this type of system, but they never did. I don't know what happened to the link. It's a little bit messy. Uh, the example is Inmarsat. That is also uh, international. Uh, uh, communication system for mobile services. And uh, broadcast satellite service, which is direct to home or to the community, and the direct TV is one good example of the direct uh, broadcast. Uh, by the way, for this broadcast satellite system, uh, the ITO has defined uh, anywhere between 6 to 9 degrees separation between satellites in this space. So if your satellite is uh, uniquely designed to broadcast 
uh, television program, for example, they have to be served by six to nine degrees. And the reason for that is because we are much more higher power uh, satellites than the FSS and MSS. They use more power in the those satellites because of the, the broadcasting uh, characteristics. And for that reason, they need to be separated more so they won't interfere with one another. This is the top 10 big uh, satellite service operators and their revenues. The largest one, as I said, is the Intelstar, which uh, Panasat uh, was merged with it uh, two years ago. Actually, Panasat was uh, also the second uh, biggest communication system that uh, I used to take my students to their, uh, they had the TTIC, uh, the control uh, station in Brooklyn, New York. And I used to take my students there for a whole day for to tour the site and see the antennas and transmitter, receiver, amplifier, all the topics that you discuss in the class, they, they have the opportunity to see it. And that's uh, one big advantage for any type of technology courses is the students have the opportunity to uh, actually see the physical uh, uh, systems. They, they will understand it much better. So I used to take them every semester. They closed it down because it was very interested and they closed that one in the Brooklyn side. But they have uh, 51 satellites, uh, total uh, revenue, and the revenue is over $2 billion. And if you look at the rest of them, the total revenue for all these 10 is about $10 billion a year. And this excludes the uh, Echo uh, Star and Direct TV, uh, the broadcast. Uh, and this is a 2010 uh, future on forecast for global cellular service uh, demand, uh, which shows in 2009 you have uh, over 6,036 megahertz uh, demand, and uh, this 36 megahertz is uh, a unique a, a unit that is used for transponders. So the space segment uh, has uh, a limited uh, bandwidth, uh, usually in the uh, the lower frequency it has about 500 megahertz of bandwidth. So one satellite has about 500 megahertz of bandwidth. And that 500 megahertz of bandwidth divided to 36 uh, megahertz units. And each one of these 36 megahertz units is called a transponder. So this is uh, the number of transponders that is uh, in demand for 2009 is over 6,000. In 2019 is about 10,000. So that uh, shows that the demand for the space segment is increasing, and uh, you can see on the side the different type of services that you demand is. Uh, DTS, DTS. Direct to home and direct uh, broadcasting. Right. What's the total bandwidth uh, available? Well, the, as you <coughs> for each satellite is about 500 megahertz. This is at the uh, lower frequency. If you go in higher frequency, which are not that many satellites built, it could be up to 3,500 megahertz. So if you consider the geostationary orbit, for example, which is 360 degrees, 2 degree separation that gives you about 180 satellites, and you have this direct broadcasting system which needs 6 to 9 degree separation. So on the average, you have about 150 satellites in that orbit. So if you multiply that 150 satellites by 500 megahertz on average, you'll get the total bandwidth for the whole uh, geostationary orbit. So that's how much. Uh, so I'm just wondering, sort of, what percent, can you estimate what percent saturation? What is that going to be more space? Well, uh, it's limited. That is a naturally limited uh, geostationary orbit. You cannot have more than 150 satellites in that orbit. That is it. It's not going to change. Uh, the only thing that will change is the technology that is used to utilize this limited uh, uh, orbital uh, space. And one way is to go higher in frequency. When you go higher in frequency, you have more bandwidth. Uh, at C band, which is 6 kilohertz, you will have about 500 megahertz. When you go to KU band or KA band, which is at 30 gigahertz, you will have 3,500 megahertz. So that means you have seven times more bandwidth at KA band than you have at C band. So that by itself is increasing the amount of bandwidth by a factor of five or seven. So. Uh, Technology-wise, you can increase the bandwidth, but uh, in terms of the number of satellites, you are uh, unfortunately limited. Uh, a spectrum, and uh, these are two naturally limited uh, resources, the, the spectrum and the geostationary. 
And this is the geotation over three satellite capacity supply uh, forecast for, from 2010 to 2019. And actually, this shows the three frequency bands that I mentioned. These are the most widely used frequency bands in satellite communications C band, KU band, and KA band. So you see, most of them are uh, using KU band. And KU band is 14 gigahertz uplink, 12 gigahertz downlink. C band is 6 gigahertz uplink and 4 gigahertz downlink. KA band is 30 gigahertz uplink and 20 gigahertz down. The problem with going to higher frequency, of course, you would like to go higher frequency because you have more bandwidth. And uh, as everyone knows, the higher the frequency, the more bandwidth you will have. But the problem is also, as you go higher in frequency, you will have more attenuation of the signal. Mm -hmm. So the, your, uh, and the reason for that, as everyone uh, again knows, is the relationship between frequency and wavelength. They are inversely related. So you go higher in frequency, your wavelength is uh, reduced. The wavelength as the KA band becomes so small that the size of the wavelength becomes comparable to the size of the uh, particles in the space. It's uh, maybe a raindrop uh, if you have during this storm. So the signal which has a wavelength of the size of a raindrop will attenuate going through the, the, the rain uh, rather than the C band which has a much larger wavelength of the can go through the uh, rain with no attenuation or very little attenuation. So that, that is the limiting factor. You go higher frequency, your attenuation uh, increases and uh, unless the technology comes to a point that they can uh, overcome that attenuation with uh, amplifying it. Uh, uh, is crossover a problem at all and is it worse at higher frequencies or yours? No, actually crossover, uh, as you go higher in the frequency, the usage of the, that frequency is less. So okay. the, the interference actually reduces when you go, which is crossover. And so okay, you mentioned downloads in terms of frequency. Uh, can you translate anything into downloads in terms of time or bandwidth or how, how much information you can get? Is, is that higher or lower at these higher... Um, when the higher frequency, you have uh, higher bandwidth and the faster the downlink you get speed. Right. Right. Now, as, uh, <coughs> there is a very approximate equation between the frequency and the bandwidth, and the bandwidth is one-tenth of this uh, center frequency, mm -hmm. uh, approximately. So you, have, you go higher uh, in frequency, like in terahertz for fiber optics, you have uh, almost a terahertz of bandwidth. Of course, you don't need that much of bandwidth, but uh, you get that much of bandwidth. So as you go higher uh, yeah. frequency, you get more bandwidth. Yeah. Yeah. This shows the global MSS uh, market. Uh, global star, Iridium, uh, Inmarsat are some of the ones that we just referred to. So these are uh, how they have uh, the markets. This shows the uh, uh, Comparison between fiber optic and these different uh, three orbital uh, communication systems that we talked about in uh, stationary in medium f orbit and large orbit. For example, the transmission speed uh, for fiber optic, as you can see, is uh, 10 gigabits per second to 3.2 terabits per second, whereas for the satellite, it's uh, much less. And when you go to a lower orbit, it even reduces. Transmission latency. Uh, that was a question, 25 to 50 milliseconds for fiber optic is about 10 times for geostationary orbit, 250 milliseconds. So that, uh, and this uh, 250 milliseconds is one way. So you will have to come down from the satellite, that's you can 250. So you have uh, 500 milliseconds, uh, half a uh, second of delay, which uh, in some applications like interactive gaming or Maybe a stock market, if you want to use satellite, maybe those uh, <coughs> longer delay times might uh, impact uh, your, uh, your function. And uh, system availability, uh, broadcasting capability, multicasting capability, and so on, that you can see that satellites uh, in some of these, of course, uh, has a big advantage. What is trunking capability? Trunking capability is uh, very high capacity interaction between two points. For example, if you switch it, that you have in a uh, city like New York, you have uh, hundreds of thousands of channels going from one switching center to another. Fiber optic would be the best and only solution uh, that can do it. On your previous slide, you had uh, subscribers sort of suggested to me that 
the people that were operating the communication systems are different from the ones who are putting the satellites in space. Is that the case? Yeah, well, so, uh, yes, uh, in most cases uh, that is the case. Like, uh, for example, Intelsat. Intelsat is uh, a provider. They uh, have a contract for to build a satellite, launch a satellite, put it in, in space, and then they lease it to the users. So if uh, I, 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 me as a user want to broadcast two TV channels and maybe 2,000 more channels, I will lease 9 megahertz of the bandwidth of the standard that Intelsat has already put in space and pay Intelsat uh, whatever the amount is. Uh, for each transponder, which is about 36 megahertz that I mentioned previously, uh, the number was about $2 million a year. So me as a user, I can pay $2, $2 million a year to use 36 megahertz which, as you know, for a TV channel, if you use a compressed digitized uh, uh, signal, you can use it maybe 4 megahertz of bandwidth for each uh, TV channel. So you can have uh, as many TV channels as you want, with as many voice channels as you want for just one transponder. And they can lease the uh, partial uh, transponders. You don't have to lease the whole transponder. They, uh, even lately, they have said even if you need 1 megahertz of bandwidth, they can uh, lease it to you. So the builders and uh, companies that have satellites are usually different uh, than the uh, users, except the countries that they have their own domestic system. The country decides to have their own domestic system for their own purposes. They collect all the information to see first of all whether it's feasible to put a satellite in this space, do they need 500 megahertz of bandwidth uh, for their need or not. If they come up with a uh, feasibility a study that Five miles, 500 megahertz is what we need for our voice, video, and data communication for the whole country. Then that is a good justification to spend somewhere around three to four hundred million dollars investment in satellite, ground station monitoring, and all that. If the, they don't come up with that number of uh, uh, that amount of bandwidth, they come up with maybe 50 megahertz of bandwidth for their need. Then they only they just leave uh, a space segment from these. Uh, there are some private companies which is, don't have anywhere near the kind of money that we're trying to launch satellites. Now, how how are they going to be able to do that? Private companies. Yeah, they just, yeah. Just, uh, people but people who are interested uh, are building satellites and I mean just down thirty miles from here. And I don't understand how they're going to be able to launch their satellite. Well, uh, well, the standards are, the, the number that I'm giving, 300 to 400 million dollars, are for geostationary standards. So for lower quality standards, uh, it's much, much less. So it might not in tens of millions of dollars. So they don't, uh, and uh, first of all, they have to get the licensing from FCC. They have to make sure that everything is according to the regulations. They have to have a contract with the launching uh, company to launch it. Uh, I was here in 1994 for a few months and I was uh, working with the Stanford University the, the Space Tech uh, Science uh, Department. And uh, I learned at that time that they had a few courses in telecommunication in the Stanford, in Stanford University that still they might have it. And uh, when they the student get to the second or third level of the classes, they were able to build a satellite, a small satellite, and have a L'Oreal space uh, nearby to launch it for them for maybe a month or two uh, as a forward uh, signal and just uh, to communicate the signal with them as experimental for their class. And at the end of the month, they would deorbit it and uh, it's gone. But those kind of satellites uh, are much cheaper. Now they have come up with uh, what is called TubeSat that is uh, cubicle is very small and uh, universities are using that as a uh, means to educate their students what is what satellite is made of, what are the components within the satellite, how the signal is uh, transmitted and received. And those are in like hundreds of thousands that NSF actually uh, has sponsored. Thank you. Uh, operational line of a satellite that was a question earlier is, is I said 15 to 20, and that's actually the better answer than this 12 to 15. This is a number that uh, was before, but now they've expanded it to 20 years. But uh, most of the time, uh, I think that they limit the lifespan themselves. Uh, of course, the lifespan, as you know, it depends on the energy that can run the satellite, and that energy comes from the solar, uh, solar energy, from the solar panels. 
So the solar panels on the side of the satellite uh, that absorb the energy from the sun, and these solar panels can rotate and uh, uh, get the energy on the other side, and then relay that energy to the batteries within the satellite to run all the substances on the satellite. The efficiency of these solar cells uh, is used by time. So when it gets to 15 to 20 years, instead of having 35 percent efficiency, five minutes. Uh, the efficiency is much less, so they actually won't have uh, enough efficiency to run the satellite. Okay, so let me go. This, is, this shows the anatomy of the satellite, what different parts of the satellite is made of. Thermal control, tracking, and communication, and pointing, and so on. This is the frequency band that I was referring to. It started with C band, and previously now is they're working towards KA band, which is much higher frequency. These are some of the frequency usage in uh, commercial as well as government. Uh, you can see that CKU and KA band are used in Intelsat and Teledensity and other systems. Since I think all these slides will be somewhere that everyone can access it, uh, I'll just uh, go through it a little fast. Yeah. It's a wacky question, but I have to ask. Sure. These are the known satellites. Are there perhaps hundreds of spy satellites, sure. German satellites, sure. Russian satellites we don't know about? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And those are uh, classified satellites. Uh, no one has uh, information other than the government. Mm -hmm. That's true. This is just a basic building block of a satellite. The satellite cannot transfer uplink the satellite and the downlink. Uh, during this uplink and downlink, there is about 200 dB uh, signal loss. 200 dB. Wow. That's a big signal loss. You can imagine how much it is. And you have to make up for that by the gain of the antenna and the amplification and the, the, the transmission and the reception and all that to be able to make something out of the signal when it gets to the satellite and then uh, it's yes. 200 dB on the uh, what? Yes, yes. Wow. Yeah. Actually, one of the, the course that I teach uh, in, the, in my college, I set up uh, a link such as this in a lab laboratory environment. Uh, this panels that I mentioned that they went out of business with the remote with each other, they donated uh, some equipment to us so I set up a transmitter receiver in the two ends of the room and then use the uh, uh, attenuators, uh, coaxial or wave-wide attenuators between the two to attenuate 200 dB of the signal from one side of the room to the other. So you, send, you see the signal that is sent from one side going through 200 dB loss, what how would it look like? And then we did that amplification. So it's very uh, useful uh, experiment. This just shows uh, how the signal gets uh, up and down to the satellite and from the satellite, from the modulator to the frequency converter, because you go from IF to RF, and even in the RF you have to change from C band to KU band in the satellite, so you do an up converter in the satellite until you get to the field antenna and then to the satellite. And this is the basic structure for VISTA. Uh, VISTA is a very small active terminal system, it's used mostly for banking system, for uh, retail stores or uh, automobile industries, any company which has a, a main headquarter and then hundreds of thousands of branches, either countrywide or worldwide, they use Visa, very small types of terminal. Mostly financial institutions like banks, they use it. Uh, they have, uh, there are two topologies for it. One is a store when you have a main hall and uh, remote uh, size, and the other one is mesh network where the size of the antenna is larger but all of the antennas can communicate with one another to the satellite. Distance education, this takes us distance education. So this distance education is the distance learning that will provide you with the uh, access of the same uh, level of quality of uh, information from remote areas. And uh, in the satellite sense, it started from 1957 when the Sputnik was launched by the Russians and then U.S. adopted uh, uh, National Defense of Education Act. This just gives you some uh, dates where uh, it all uh, started uh, Pan Pacific Education and Communication Experiment by satellite in 1971. Indian government plans to use new type of American communication satellite for educational program. Even in Iran in 1975, uh, they invested $10 million 
with the Stanford University Design and Communication Standard for Educational Purposes. And most recently, in 2002, the Direct Way Global Education Services to Satellite has been launched, and in 2004, uh, India launched a uh, satellite uh, age of staff of easy to staff uh, only for uh, educational purposes. There uh, is a number of countries that uh, are using uh, uh, either satellite or internet for uh, their uh, uh, education remotely. Uh, uh, internet and distance education also the, the difference between internet and satellite, as uh, you all know, satellite is a real-time interactive type of communication, whereas uh, internet might not be, you might even record a, a lecture and put it on internet, the students can access it, but they won't have the uh, opportunity to ask you questions and all that, but in, in satellite you have a, a one-way video and two-way uh, audio. So the video is sent to all the locations, but the audio is two-way, the instructor we will speak as soon as we hear the students have questions, they will ask the instructor and they will get the response. Let me just go through this uh, very quickly. Uh, well, the reasons why the silo broadband is effective because of several reasons that I mentioned. Well, let me go. So, the examples of uh, silo for business education. For example, in Brazil, 27,700 classrooms. Uh, from 300 schools that they use, uh, they are connected with the huge net, which is a huge network system, HNS in German from Maryland, uh, that's the system that they are using to get connected uh, to satellite. In uh, Ethiopia, there's uh, 1,000 schools that receive uh, instruction of how to call satellite video in different remote areas. In uh, Mexico, there's this uh, program that provides 50,000 classrooms throughout the country using satellite communication. In uh, India, Asia, the satellite that I just mentioned was launched in 2004, uh, provides 4,000 students throughout the country, and uh, there uh, are 30 uh, satellite hubs. And, uh, and this is one of the biggest networks because uh, the two only terminals and also interactive terminals at different frequency bands, and uh, they use it uh, for education. 64 network operational, 3,300 interactive classrooms, and 30,000 PC only classrooms. This is all through the satellite system. South of Thailand, this is a unique uh, application. It says that in, the, in that region of the Thailand, it's very dangerous to have classes, even CD and DVD. It's uh, more costly to give to the students. So the only way is to provide uh, satellite uh, training you know, to the students because of the danger that the students might be living in that area. Um, I guess I'm running out, but I quickly explore this couple of times. The second role in telemedicine is potentially applicable to health services. It permits best use of uh, limited hospital space and it helps to resolve the problem of unequal access to health. And this is the, the normal setup for uh, uh, uptake and downlink. These are the type of information you can see on the screen remotely the patient's information, the heartbeat, the pulse rate, and all the rest of the information for the patient. And the expert is sitting in the main hospital and uh, looking at this uh, image that was sent me from the remote area and sending that doctor who doesn't maybe have the specialty in uh, cardiology or whatever it is and instructing what to do to save the life of the patient. Telemedicine depends on effective transfer of medical information that ICT and ICT plays a big role in, uh, in this area that was mentioned earlier this morning. Mm -hmm. Standard communication with access was from virtually any location uh, could be used for uh, the development of telemetry. Okay, I'll uh, stop at this point. I'm almost going to end, but uh, if uh, you have any questions, uh, Super quick question. The technology that allowed the thick issues to become small issues, did that improve the electronics of the right. receiver? Uh, it has, and the reason that the large tissues have become the small is because the frequency is going oh. from low to high. So sure. the higher the frequency, the smaller the tissue. Sorry, so we're Thank you. Thank you.